If you've got a Bible there with you, I do want you would encourage you to open up with me to uh, Romans chapter 8 so you can follow along with us. If you don't have a Bible, again, we'll always have the Bibles there in the back. The ushers will pass them around. But as we go through uh, this, this passage, you're really going to want to be able to follow along uh, with us. And I'm just going to be taking you through these, uh, through these five, five verses this morning. You know, sometimes I wonder if I'm even saved. There's something a pastor friend of mine once said to me. Sometimes I wonder if I'm even a Christian. I wonder if I'm even, even one of God's people. He was, he was struggling with particular sin in his life that he'd been wrestling with long term. And he just couldn't seem to get past it. He couldn't seem to beat it. He was trying and he was trying and he was trying. He was working at it. Everything that you could think of that you could do in order to deal with this particular sin in his life, he was trying to do it. But it just seemed like he couldn't get past it. And as a result, he was dealing with guilt and with shame. And he got to the point, as a, even as a pastor, he's questioning his own salvation. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt that guilt and shame? Have you ever been wrestling with that sin in your life to such a degree that you're looking at it and going, okay, this, I don't understand why I'm still stuck in the same place and I just can't seem to get beyond this. And you begin to wrestle with that doubt, those questions that are, that are nagging inside of your head, that question of, well, if, if I'm really a Christian, is this really the way it should be? Am, am I really saved if I'm still struggling with the same thing? After all this time, after all these years, is it possible that I just really am not one of God's people? Have you ever, ever been there? We started a new series last week through Romans chapter 8. And for some people, the book of Romans is a little bit scary. It's a little bit frightening. Long, drawn-out sentences, big words that sometimes, you you know, even, even for me, there's times where I'm reading it, I'm going, okay, I've got to read that about ten times in order to try to get an idea of what's even being said at this point. We look at it, and we get overwhelmed by it. But here in Romans chapter 8, this is one of, there, there's just, Obviously, it's all of God's Word, but there's certain moments where you go, but this is just one of those mountaintop passages that you come to. And yes, sometimes difficult to understand, but if you can get it, it's life-changing. It is a life-transforming chapter. In fact, it is a chapter of hope for every single Christian in this room. No matter where you are, no matter what you're struggling with, it doesn't matter what you're wrestling with, this chapter applies to your life. It speaks to directly where you are. If you're struggling with doubt, this passage speaks to you. If you're wrestling with guilt and shame, this chapter is for you. If you're wrestling with the uncertainty of future circumstances in your life, you don't really know what's coming, and you're struggling with that, this chapter is for you. If you're wrestling with condemnation, this chapter is for you. If you're going through any sort of struggle or difficulty in your life, whether it be a loss of a loved one, whether it be a job loss, whether it be struggling with bills, whether whatever it is, then this chapter is for you. It's an amazing chapter of hope that applies to every single, every single struggle that you could face as a Christian. God addresses right here in this one chapter of the Bible. It's filled with amazing hope. But the place Paul starts, actually, he starts with hope, but really there's one word, and as we looked at last week, chapter 8, verse 1, he says, there is therefore. That one word points back to everything that he's been saying up to this point in time. And to get the hope of this passage, what Paul says with that one word is, if you're going to understand the full hope that is present here for you in the midst of whatever the struggle is that you're facing today, if you want to get the full and radical hope that God wants to fill your life with, because that's the Christian life. The Christian life is a life of, life of hope. It's not the kind of hope where we, we knock on wood and we cross our fingers and we hope that it works out. That's the world's kind of hope. It's wishful thinking. The kind of hope we're talking about is a confident hope that is filled with certainty even if you don't have it yet. I mean, hope is you're looking forward to something that you don't have yet, but the kind of hope that we've been given isn't a questioning, wishful thinking. It is a certainty that God wants to fill your life up with. And that one word, therefore, Paul says, if you're going to get the full measure of hope that God wants you to have, then you've got to understand the full reality of the problem. Therefore, points all the way back to the first seven chapters and what, where Paul starts is with the seriousness of the problem. And the problem is this. We've been born into a world where there is a creator. There is a God. 
He says, we look around our world at us, around us, and here's what we see. There's a design. Order does not come from chaos. Order does not come from chaos. The reason that you see the things that you see, the reason that life exists, the reason that the planet is where it is in the solar system, the reason it's close enough to the sun to have the warmth, the temperature for us to survive, but not so far away that we freeze, it, the reason that the, the oxygen levels that we have exist, the reason that you and I can live and breathe and have our lives is because there is a designer. It's not chance. You are not chance. You are not just an accident of atoms that have smashed together. There is a creator. There is a designer. But here's the problem. We live in a world where there's a creator, but we also live in a world where every single one of us has said to that creator, we're going to live as if you don't exist. You're there, but we're going to act like you're not there. We're going to act as if we are the ones who made all of this. We're going to act as if this is all that there is, and we're, just going to, we're not going to live for you. I mean, yes, you, there's, a creator, we, there's a creator and a designer, but we're going to live as if you don't really deserve any attention at all in our lives. We're going to live for ourselves. We're going to, do our, we're going to live our own way. We're not going to seek you. We're not going to seek your design. We're going to live as if we've got it all figured out. And not only that, we're not going to worship you. We're not going to serve you with our lives. We're going to worship the things in this world. We're going to worship money, and we're going to worship uh, our jobs, and we're going to worship relationships, and we're going to worship sex, and we're going to worship, you name it, we worship it. We live for it. It's that thing that we build our lives around. That's what we're doing. And as a result, Paul says, here's what we've done. Every single person has broken God's law. We've all sinned, and we've fallen short of God's standard. And what we deserve, Romans 6, what we deserve, what we've earned, the wage that we deserve to be paid because we've rejected the Creator and lived our for ourselves, is we deserve death, separation from God, not just in eternity, but today in this world. We deserve condemnation. We deserve judgment. Paul says that, that therefore, when he says there is therefore now no condemnation, he says there's a reason that you feel condemned. There's a reason that you feel that you don't measure up. There's a reason that you feel like it doesn't matter how hard you work, it's never enough. You never arrive. There's always more. You always have to do more. The reason that you feel that way is because that's the reality of things. You feel like you're in a prison because you are in a prison. You are trapped trying to do the impossible. You're trying to fix what's broken, and he says, here's the real problem. You can't fix it. Good works don't work. See, everybody in this world, in some way, shape, or form, is trying to patch up the brokenness in their lives. And Paul, what Paul says is what you're really trying to do is you're trying to use the law you're trying to follow rules in order, and trying to do enough good stuff in your life in order to try to make what's broken right. But the problem, Paul says, with the law is you're treating it as a ladder, but it's actually a wall. You're trying to cl climb an impossible wall. The wall is there. The law is there so that we keep banging up against it so that we can see in our sin that we can't make it right. We can't make ourselves right with God. We can't fix the brokenness in our lives. We need to be rescued. Paul says you feel condemned because you are condemned. And you can't fix that problem. But here's where all the good news, right? That's all the bad news. That's the hopelessness. That's, that's how bad it really is. There is nothing that you and I can do to fix it. But here's where the good news comes in. He says there's no condemnation. You feel condemned because you are. But for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Because in Jesus, God did what we couldn't do. He did the impossible. See, we were trying to use the law to make ourselves right with God. Jesus comes and takes on humanity, takes on flesh and blood. Paul says here, he says it's in the first 11 verses, he says he took on the likeness of sinful flesh. It's not that he was kind of human. He was fully human. He became like us. He ate like us. He slept like us. He drank like us. He talked like us. He lived like us in every way except for one. He was without sin. Jesus Christ came and lived the life that we should have the life that we couldn't live, the life of perfect sinless obedience in our place. It says for sin so that he could go to the cross and take our place. It's what we celebrated last Friday. Jesus took our place. He goes to the cross. He took all of your sin, all of my sin, past, present, and future on himself and paid the full measure of the penalty that we deserved. Paul says there's no condemnation. Here's why. Because Jesus took it all on himself. He was condemned in our place, not because he was sinful, but because he took your sin on himself. And he got treated on the cross as you and I deserve to be treated in our place. 
He died, was buried, but as we celebrated on Sunday, he didn't stay dead. He rose again, he conquered sin and death, and the empty tomb became the hole in the prison wall. It became the way out. Jesus says, there is a way out, but here's the deal, you've got to follow me. And the way of following Jesus is through the cross, through the empty tomb, and that's the only way out. Which means, here's the deal. If you want out, you've got to stop trying to make your own way out. If you want out, you've got to stop trying to earn it. You've got to stop trying to make your own way. And again, you may not be using God's law. You may be using your own law, but you are using a law. You're following something in order to try to make the brokenness in your life right. Because you intuitively know it's broken. And whether you're using God's law or your own law, you're trying to fix it. And here's the deal. Jesus says there is a way out, but you've got to stop trying to use whatever that is that you're trying to use to fix it. You've got to trust me that I have done it all. I've made it possible. And you've got to go out the tomb with me. You've got to lay down your effort. You've got to lay down your trying. Romans chapter 4, verse 4. Remember, Paul's referring back. He's going all the way back and he's saying, listen, here's the deal. The person who earns a wage, you get what you deserve. That's every man-made religion in the world. But that's not Christianity. Christianity isn't you get what you deserve. Jesus got what you deserve so you could get what he deserved. You get grace. You get the opposite of what you deserve. The exact opposite of what you deserve. You get not worse, you get infinitely better because of what Jesus has done for you. And you don't get it because you earned it. You get it because you laid down your trying. You laid down your effort. To him who stops working but believes, that person, Romans chapter 4 verse 5 says, that person is made right with God. Every other religion says, work for it and you'll earn it. Christianity says the only way you get it is if you stop working and you actually receive it as a gift. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift is eternal life. You can't get it unless you take it as a gift. And the only way you get a gift is if you come empty-handed. But if you do come empty-handed, if you take it as a gift, if you lay it down and you entrust your life to the, the one who went through the cross and the empty tomb, you follow him. You surrender to the Savior and King. Here's what happens. Paul says something so radical that the only way he can describe it is you get made new. You get made new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he says this. Therefore, is any, if anyone is in Christ, and that phrase, remember, chapter 8, verse 1 of Romans, there is no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus. And so Paul says, for anyone who is in Christ, same term, same phrase, if you're in Christ, if you're a follower of Christ, if you've entrusted your life to Jesus as Savior and King, listen, He is a new creation. The old life has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself. That language, by the way, it reminds me of the end of time. Revelation chapter 21, listen to it. See if it sounds familiar. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, the old one, had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things, the old things, have passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. We are looking forward to that day. That day is coming. That is what we're anticipating. We'll talk about that more next week. But here's the radical thing. You need to hear this. The radical thing that Paul says is for anyone who is in Christ, it's not you will be a new creation. He says, you are a new creation. You already are. You have been made new. If anyone is in Christ, the old life is gone. The old way of living is passed away and a whole new way of living has come. The old life of being in prison is gone. The new life of freedom is yours already. And here's what that means. You're not trying. The Christian life isn't about trying to get something you don't have already. It's trying to become who God says you already are. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. And the four things that we said from that passage in Romans, the first 11 verses, the four things we said last week, here's what that means. There's no more condemnation. Not 
you're just not condemned right now and maybe you'll be condemned again later on. No, there is no more condemnation ever again. If you feel condemned, and we'll talk about this again this morning a little bit, if you feel condemned, it's not because you are. It's just a feeling. There is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Number two, you've been set free from the law of sin and death. And here's what that means. That means, see, the law of sin and death was you trying to use the law to try to earn God's acceptance, favor, and love, and forgiveness. And here's what it always did. It crushed you. That was the law of sin and death. You've been set free from that because here's what you have. Because of Jesus, you have the full and complete acceptance of God, not on the basis of what you do, but on the basis of Jesus Christ and what he's already done for you. That means you cannot add or take away from the acceptance that's already yours. You don't have to try to earn it anymore. You've been set free from there's no condemnation. You don't have to try to earn his forgiveness. You don't have to have to earn his favor. You don't have to earn his love, his acceptance of you. You are accepted already. Accept that you are accepted. That's what salvation really is. You are accepted. Not only that, but here's what Paul says. When you believed, the Holy Spirit came and made his dwelling in you. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, if you are a believer, he came and made his dwelling inside of you. You can't get any closer than that. You've been given a whole new relationship with God in which the Spirit has now filled your life and he set you free. In fact, chapter 8, verse 11, read it with me. He says, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He's presenting it as an if, but what he's really saying is it's a reality. The Holy Spirit who... Remember, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. If He does, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. In other words, if you believed the very power and life of the resurrection, the Holy Spirit has come and made His dwelling inside of you. You are now, you are alive. A new creation in Christ Jesus. You've been made new. And now what Paul says here as we begin in verse 12, he says, you've been made new, now live new. You have been made new. And so now live it. And take a look. He says, verse 12, so then. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. He says, so now we are debtors. One of the mistakes we make when it comes to Christianity is thinking that, well, Jesus set us free, so now we don't have to do anything anymore. We just kind of drift around, and we don't owe anything to anyone. No one really rules our lives. Because Jesus set us free, now we can live however we want, do whatever we want, because that's what salvation is. He says, hold on for a second. I want you to understand, you've been set free, but understand that doesn't mean freedom is not being able to do whatever you want whenever you want. Freedom, as we talked about before, is the context that enables you to be fully who you were created to be. Freedom is the context that enables you to be fully who you were created to be. And here's who you were created to be. You were created to know God, to love God, and to serve God. That's your design. And if you don't live that, then you're not free. You're a prisoner. It's only when you live that that you actually find freedom. He says, see, we're not debtors. And there's two ways you can think of debtors. When you're in debt, you owe someone something, and that debt owns you. You can't get out from under it. You owe it. You are responsible for it. And he says, here's the thing. You are no longer owned by a debt to the old life, the old life that you lived according to the flesh. You know, the word flesh means the way that you were born naturally into sin. Everyone was born in flesh. And you used to be owned by sin. It used to control you. You had no choice. And you lived it, and he says, you don't owe anything to that. That doesn't own you anymore because you've been set free from that. And here's why that's so wonderful. See, some people think, well, I'll just believe in Jesus, and then I can just go back, and I can just live in sin, and I don't have to change at all. I'll just keep doing that. But what they misunderstand in that moment is, you're saying, I'm going to accept salvation and then still live as a slave. Because here's the thing about sin. Look at what he says as he continues. Verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. See, the lie of sin and it is always a lie, is if you live in sin, then you'll really live. Right? If I really, if I, if I don't sin, then I'm going to be missing out. Right? Some of us, you remember back when you were in high school and the party scene was breaking out and you were afraid, well, if I don't go to the party, I'll really be missing out. See, sin always sells you that way. It says, if you don't live this way, you'll be missing out. If you really want to be happy, come and do this. But here's the thing. Paul says it's always a lie because it always leads to death. And there's some people who say, ah, but I've lived in sin all the time and I'm not dead. Listen to me. There are more ways to die than one. 
Death isn't just a physical, my heart stops beating. You can die relationally. You can die emotionally. You can die financially. See, there's more ways that sin leads to death and more ways than just that your heart stops beating. Yes, one day your heart will stop beating. That is a consequence for sin. But there's more deaths than just that. I remember sitting with a couple who uh, came to me and they were uh, an older couple. They had kids, but they were struggling with alcohol addiction. And I sat with them and I said, tell me, why do you drink? And we finally, we worked through it and finally it came out. Well, we drink because we want to escape. We want to, it's, life is hard and we're dealing with all these problems and all these struggles. And I said, okay, well, let me, so you drink to escape. Does it work? And here's the truth about sin. If sin never worked to a certain degree, you wouldn't do it. They said, yes, well, it does work. And I said, well, tell me, how long does it work? So you get drunk. You get drunk, and yes, you escape reality. How long does it work? They said, well, it's getting less and less. It doesn't work the way that it used to work. It used to last for a few hours, and now maybe we've gotten to the point where it lasts for maybe a half an hour. I said, okay, so now you escape reality, and then when you come back to reality, is it better, the same, or worse? And they said, well, it's worse. I said, well, describe that. What do you mean it's worse? They said, well, when we come out of being drunk, we feel more guilty. We feel more ashamed. We feel more condemned. We've been drunk and our kids have been in the house. We haven't been taking care of them. We're blowing all of our money. We're, we're in debt. We can't even afford our bills because we're paying so much. Our relationships are being destroyed. Our finances are being destroyed. Our emotions are being destroyed because we're filled with guilt and shame. And that's what sin does. And here's what happens. You come back out and you feel guilty and ashamed and sin comes back and it says, see, if you just drink a little bit more, you'll feel better. And that's how addictions get created. See, sin always leads to addiction and addiction always ends up crushing you and destroying your life. And that is sin. He says, you, that doesn't own you anymore. You don't have to live that way anymore. You've been set free. You can be who you were created to be. He says, verse 13, he says, but if the spirit, if you live by the spirit, if you live by the one that you owe your life to, you put to death the deeds of the body. And by the way, when we talk about being of, of owing, of being debtors, here's the message. The good news of the gospel is that you've been set free. But think about how you've been set free, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. He says, see, you have been rescued and saved from an old life to a new life. It's not just that you've been saved from something, you've been saved to something. You've been rescued from the kingdom of darkness in which sin reigned over you and it was destroying you and it was dehumanizing you. And you have, Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, through Christ been transferred into a new kingdom, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Where unlike the old kingdom, under the old way of life, where it was destroying you, when you follow Christ, he actually builds you up as you follow after him, as he leads you, as the Spirit leads you. And if the Spirit leads you, here's what it means. It means you don't live in sin anymore, you kill it. You don't play with the fire, you put it out. He says, again, verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What it means to live in the new life is you're not going to live in sin anymore. You're not going to let it rule your life anymore. Instead, you're going to be radical with it. You're going to kill it. You're going to put it to death. You're going to be serious about it. You're not going to toe the line. You're not going to play with it. You're going to run the other direction. You're going to be Joseph running from Potiphar's wife. You're not going to play anymore. It reminds me of Jesus' words back in Matthew chapter 5 where he says, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He's not being literal there. He's saying you can't mess with sin anymore. You can't play with it any longer. It isn't something that you can just mess around with because sin isn't a thing. You, when you mess around with it, here's what it does. It owns you. And so here's what you've got to be doing. John Owen, old Puritan pastor and writer, put it this way. He says, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Those are your two options. You're either going to be killing sin. You're going to radically deal with the sin in your life. That means you're going to be intentional. You're not going to be passive. You're not going to just drift through. You're going to take active, intentional steps to get sin out of your life. You're either going to be killing it or it's going to be killing you. But here's the great news. 
You've been made new so you can live new. You don't have to live under that any longer. And if you do, if you're killing sin, he says, here's the promise. You will live. He's not talking physically. Your heart's going to be beating. He's saying here's it's a quality of life. It's an experience. Jesus came, John chapter 10, verse 10, that you might have life and have it to the fullest. You might be who you were actually made to be. You might be who you were created to be. Jesus came so that you might have life abundantly. And if you're killing sin, if you're following and being led by the Spirit, then here's what's going to happen. You're going to live. You're going to experience it. John Owen says, be killing sin or it'll be killing you. I would add onto that, be killing sin and the spirit will be filling you. You will experience the fullness of life that God intends for you to experience if you will do it, if you will follow. Then you'll live. And all of that is great. All of that is wonderful. But even as I say all of this, here's, here's the reality that I think many of us are experiencing here this morning. We're not experiencing the made new side of Christianity. See, Paul says there is now no condemnation. If there's no condemnation, why does he have to tell us? If it's something that we never wrestle with, why does he have to remind us of that? He has to remind us because many of us, many Christians are walking around and you are walking around as if you're still condemned. See, you hear all of us, you go, I've been made new and now live new. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And you're sitting there going, and here's my experience, Dan. Sin is killing me. I know I'm supposed to be living a different life, but I'm not choosing it. I've been choosing sin. I've been living in sin and we feel overwhelmed by it. We feel crushed by it. You say, I want it. You're like that pastor friend of mine who's going, yeah, I want to be different. I want to live differently. I want to get there, but I'm still struggling with it. You're going, Dan, I'm supposed to be new and I'm supposed to live new, but I'm not even sure I'm saved. Because if I'm saved, why is it that I'm still struggling with sin? And here's why. Because no Christians are pretend sinners. You're a real sinner. And Christian life isn't about perfection. You didn't get made perfect. You've been made new. Right? You're not trying to attain something you are not already. But here's what you're trying to do. You're trying to grow up into what God says you already are. He didn't make you new in the sense of sin is vanquished from your life and now you're perfect. The whole Christian journey is about becoming who you already are in Christ. Which means that the Christian life isn't about sinless perfection. It's about progression and becoming more like Christ. An ongoing process where you have to be killing sin. And the struggle with that is is that as we kill sin, we see just how sinful we are. Rather than seeing less and less sin in our lives, the more you grow, the more you see of how sinful you actually are. I mean, have you experienced that? There was a sense in my life that as I was going, I believed this once upon a time when I was an idealist. Well, if I'm a Christian, the longer I'm a Christian, the less I'll see of sin in my life. And what I found to be is just the opposite. The longer I'm a Christian, the more I see how sinful I actually am. I knew I needed a Savior when I believed in Jesus, but now I see I need a Savior even more. James chapter 1 says, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. We all, all Christians, we all stumble in many ways. To be a Christian isn't to not stumble. It's to stumble in grace. Proverbs says it. Who can say I've made my heart pure? I'm clean from sin. That's a rhetorical question. Or as the wise man Ecclesiastes says, surely there's not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Or as 1 John says it, as the Apostle John says it, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The reality is this. As Christians, no one in here is a pretend sinner. We hear this whole idea of killing sin and no one has to go, man, I I don't know. Am I really, where do I sin? I'm just not really sure. No one has to do that. No one has to wonder where they sin. Our problem isn't trying to find sin. Our problem is is that we have so much sin that we're going, I don't even know where to start. And not only that, the more that I grow in Christ, the more, again, the more I see of how much of a sinner I am. You know, when Paul started as an apostle, if you read through his journey, you can actually read through and you can see the progression in Paul. At the very beginning of his ministry in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, he says, for I am the least of the apostles. Partway through his ministry, he says to me, though I am the very least of all the saints. And at the end of his ministry, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ came to save into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. See, there's a progression there. I'm the least of all the apostles. 
Now I'm the least of all of you. And now listen, go out and find the worst of sinners out there in the world and I'll tell you what, I'll beat them. Not just apostles, not just Christians, of all sinners, Paul says, I am the worst of sinners, not because he's becoming more of a sinner as he goes, but because, listen, the closer you go to the sun, the darker the shadows become. And as you experience that in your life, the danger is this. Paul says there's no condemnation, and yet here's where you are. Here's where so many Christians are living. You're living in condemnation. Because as you sin, we have an enemy who accuses us, who comes and throws our sin in our faces and says, see, look at you. You call yourself a Christian? You say that God loves you? Are you kidding me? And yet you're still doing that same. How long have you been doing this sin? Let's count the years. You say you're a follower of Christ? Where's the change? Where's the transformation? You holy of Christians, you. And not just Satan, we're told that our own hearts at times condemn us. 1 John chapter 3, the apostle writes this, By this we shall know that we have the truth and reassure our heart before God. For whenever our heart condemns us, I love and hate the fact that he doesn't say if our heart condemns us, he says whenever our hearts condemn us. I love it because it comforts me with the fact that he knows what it is to feel condemned. I hate it because I really don't want to feel condemned any longer. But he says it's not an if, it's not a question. The reality is, is you're a real sinner and you've been made new and you've been called to a new life to live new, but yet you still struggle. And the danger is this, is that you go back to living under that condemnation as if that's who you are, but that's not who you are. Paul says, if you feel that condemnation, then let me speak to you for just a moment. And just stick with me. I, I, I know I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit long right now. So just stick with me right now. Please. He says, if you're feeling condemned, then I want to talk to you. I want to speak to you. If you're struggling with that, let me remind you who you are. And I'm just going to give you these things. I'm going to walk through them. He says, let, let me tell you this. Number one, he says, verse 15, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Number one, do you understand your relationship with God and who you are? Right? If a slave disobeys his master, he has reason to fear because the relationship of the slave to the master, let's put it into an employer-employee relationship. If your boss tells you, I want you to do this, and you keep consistently not doing that, you should be afraid. Why? Because you could lose your job. I mean, if you keep not doing what your boss tells you, in fact, you're doing just the opposite, then you're going to get fired. That's just reality. That's the relationship of an employer to employee. If the employer says do it and you don't do it, you're going to get, at the least, you're going to get a poor review. At, at worst, you're going to get fired. That's the relationship. What Paul says is, do you understand? That's not your relationship to God. Your relationship to God is not an employer-employee because if it was, you never would have been hired in the first place. The reason that you fall back into fear when you are afraid is because you are living as an employee of God. But you're not an employee of God. You're not hired and you aren't relating to God on the basis of merit. You don't get a wage. You get grace. And here's what you've been given. Instead of fear, you've been given confidence because here's what you've been given. You have been given for we have what you have received, the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, you have not received a spirit of an employee relating to his employer. You've received the spirit of adoption. God has adopted you into his family by the blood of Christ. He calls you his own child. And listen to this. God made that plan to adopt you into his family before time began. Before history was in place, God, it says in Ephesians chapter 1, predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ. Now, understand what that means. God knew before you were even born that you were going to sin and need a Savior. He also made that plan to send His Son as that Savior to die in your place, to shed His blood so that by His blood you might be adopted into His family. When you go and you live in fear, do you understand how much that doesn't align with that reality? You're living as if God is surprised by your sin. You're living as God is going, I didn't see that coming. 
I, I, I thought that you would have it all together by this point in time, and you're still doing all of that. He planned to send his son to die for all of your sin, past, present, and future. See, he knew your sins you were going to commit. He knew the sins you have committed. And listen, he knows the sins that you're going to commit that you haven't even gotten to yet. And Jesus already died and paid for those in full so that you could be adopted into his family. And as an adopted child of God, God never fires you. Because your relationship isn't an employer to an employee, it's a father to his child, and that's how God relates to you. And not just as a child, it says as sons. As sons. And some people get very upset about that because, well, what about all the women in the room? Do you understand? That includes you. See, back at the time of this being written, boys were considered a special gift. If you were a son, you had certain rights and privileges that your sisters didn't have. Sons were considered a blessing. Sometimes girls were considered as less than that. You didn't have certain rights. You didn't have certain privileges. You were considered to be less. And what God does in Jesus Christ is he comes and he says, listen, everybody who I adopt, whether male or female, Jew or Greek, slave or free, doesn't matter who you are, you've been adopted and you've been adopted not as just my child, but you've been given the full rights of a son. That term sons is a position in relationship to God. It's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3. I just quoted it. There's neither slave nor Greek, nor Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for all are one in Christ. In other words, everybody has the same relationship with God. There's no favorites. I'm not somehow highly favored by God by more than anybody else because I'm a pastor. Well, I've got certain rights and privileges that the engineers in the room don't have, or the lawyers. Well, maybe the lawyers. No, I'm just kidding, Jason. We're sons. And the relationship that we have with God is our, as our Abba. He says, the Spirit now lives in you. And by the Spirit, you call out to God and you say, Abba, Father. And it's a radical term to be able to call God Abba. I don't have time to go into all of what that means, but it is a, it's in a sense a universal language. When a child is born, you know, when they first call out their name of their, of their mother or father, they don't say, my, none of my kids said, Father. What do they say? Da da. They have no teeth. They have no ability to utter certain words. It's the word of an infant. It's the word of a, a, a child that can barely speak at that point in time. It's a language that doesn't matter what culture you're from, doesn't matter what language you speak. Every infant knows what it is to utter those, those syllables. Jesus is saying this is the relationship, this is the kind of intimacy that we've been given with God, not as our master. Is he our master? Do we serve him? Yes, we are. But that's not our primary relationship. Our primary relationship to God is as our Abba. He says you, when you're living in condemnation, it's not because you are, it's because you've forgotten who you are. This is who you are. You are Abba. You, you, are, you are a child of Abba. He is your father who has adopted you into his family. And here's what's wonderful. Not only is that a truth to, to dive into when you're struggling with condemnation, he says this. He says, listen, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. He says, not only is there truth to live by, but here's the wonderful thing. God is not just passive giving you truth to believe, but God is active in engaging with you to speak to you and to remind you in your own, in your own spirit of who you are, the very Spirit of God. There are times, listen, here, I'll, I'll just give you a quote. Richard uh, Sibbs, who is another old, older Puritan, he says this. He says, sometimes our spirits cannot stand under trials. Therefore, sometimes the immediate testimony of the Spirit is necessary. The immediate testimony of the Spirit is necessary. In John, 1 John chapter 2, we're told that we have an advocate who stands before the throne. If anyone sins, we have an advocate who pleads our case, Jesus Christ, our first advocate. Before Jesus ascended back to the Father, he told the, the disciples in John 14, he says, when I go, it's good that I go because I'm sending the second advocate, another one. See, Jesus stands before the throne of grace, the throne of God, where this, we're told in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, that the enemy is always accusing, and Jesus is there pleading our case. He says there's another advocate who's going to come, and he's going to be inside of you. The Holy Spirit himself is going to argue the case as well. He's your defense attorney. He's going to come and argue, but he's not arguing to God on your behalf. That's Jesus who is arguing our case before the throne. The Spirit himself comes inside of you, and he argues the case, your case, to your very own heart. 
In those moments with you're condemned, there are times when the immediate testimony of the Spirit is necessary. He comes in saying, I am thy salvation. And our hearts are stirred up and comforted with joy inexpressible. This joy hath degrees. Sometimes it is so clear and strong that we question nothing. Other times doubts come back fairly soon. He says, this is not, there is not just a truth to live by, but there is an experience that as followers of Christ, as children of Abba, that the Spirit at times comes and He reminds us of exactly who we are in Christ. You are His child. You are His child. I've shared my story before. Uh, you know, sometimes you get very amazing moments of experience and clarity where this happens. Sometimes it's far less. But I remember about 10 years ago, I was at a place where I was living in condemnation. My sense was is that I never was pleasing to God. I felt God was the, I was the, I was the adopted child that was just constantly frustrating the father. Where he's kind of shaking his head going, man, I wish that I had not done this. And I remember one night I was reading in Matthew chapter 3, the baptism of Jesus. Some of you heard me share this before. Jesus is baptized and he comes up out of the water and he's praying and the, the heavens open and the spirit descends on him like a dove and the father's voice from heaven calls out and says, this is my son whom I love with whom I'm well pleased. And I remember in that moment I was sitting reading that passage and I remember in that moment there wasn't a voice, but it was, it, there was, a, it was that, that sense That testimony of the Spirit says, but that's what I do say about you. But not because of what you do, not because you've earned it, not because you deserve it. See, the case, the, the case that he's arguing, the Spirit never comes and says, you know what, you've been doing pretty good, Dan, you're actually okay. Don't, don't feel so condemned right now. See, the case of Jesus before the throne is never, hey, listen, this guy, he's been really trying hard, let's just lighten up on him a little bit. That's never the case. You know what the case always is? The case is always the blood of Jesus Christ. It's been paid in full. See, you, you are, the Father says, I, this is my child whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. Not because you've earned it, Dan. Not because you've deserved it, deserved it. Not because you've, you're good enough. But because Jesus has already paid it in full. And you've been covered by Him. God made Him who knew no sin to become sin for you so that in Him you might be the very righteousness of God. That when God looks at Dan Painter, in his mess and in his sin, He looks at me, but He sees me through His own Son's perfection. And He says, there's my child. It's the story of the prodigal son who's coming home to his father who wants to repent and say, Father, I'm just, I'm willing to earn it back. I'm willing to serve you. I'll live in the servants' quarters. I'll pay you back. I will earn every dime of it. And what is the father? The father doesn't stand there at a distance waiting for the son to get back and say, you're going to have to beg for it. And yeah, you're going to be working, but you're going to pay back interest as well. What does the father do? The father comes running out, running, sprinting as fast as he can. Because he sees his son coming home. He's been waiting and watching. And when you came back, when you came back, the father came running out and he throws his arms around you, his own child. Before you can get your words out, the father embraces you and he puts a robe on, he puts sandals on your feet, he puts a ring on your finger and he says, we're having a party. No, you're not going to work it off. I've already worked it off for you. No, you don't have to earn it back. I've already earned it for you. You can't earn any of this. But you are my child whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit comes and says, Dan, this is who you are. This is who you are. The other night, my son Eli, my son Eli was in his bedroom and he was scared. All my boys at some point in time have been scared of the dark. And Eli was in there and he's upset and he's calling for us to come in. And so I went into his room. I prayed with him. And he says, I'm still scared. And I said to him, I said, you know what, Eli? Let me just tell you this. You are a child of the king. And the king always takes care of his children. I didn't know how he was, you know. And you know what he did? He said, thank you. And he rolled over, and that was the last time, miraculously, the last time that I heard from him that night. But you know what happened is I heard from him again the next night, and the next every single night. So 
Some people have nightmares when they're awake. We have nightmares when we put our kids to bed. You see, the, here's what the Holy Spirit does. In those moments, he comes and he says, do you know, do you know who you are? You're a child of the king. And the king always takes care of his children. And he doesn't just do it once. And, sometimes, and it's always different. You can't, you can't bottle it up and get it to happen the same way every time. But here's what he does. He comes to you and says, in that moment of condemnation, he comes to you and he says, listen, you're a child of the king. Remember who you are. And the king always takes care of his children. You're a child of the king. The king always takes care of his children. You have to remember who you are. And here's the good news. It's not just that you have to remember it. You've got the Holy Spirit who says, let me remind you. You have been made new. There's no condemnation. You've been set free. The Holy Spirit lives within you. You have been adopted as God's own child, and there is nothing, nothing that can ever change that. You've been made new. So live new.